This is Audio Immunity, a podcast about our body's never-ending fight with the outside world. Hi everyone, this is Audio Immunity, recorded on Wednesday, February 21st. My name is Chadine Tremaglio, and I am joined by the usual suspects, Kevin Bonham. Hello. Camilla Engblom. Hello. And Kate Franz, who I am actually meeting for the first time. Hi, Kate. Hi. Nice to meet you. Oh, that's right. You guys weren't on the same <laughs> no. podcast before. This is a first. Because you were, is it true you were vomiting all over your house? I was. And your kids? It was, it was dramatic and awful. Oh, boy. It was not that Sounds fantastic. Thankfully, that I think it boy. wasn't the flu. I think it might have been Noro, yet another nasty, because it was, <laughs> oh, but it happened quick. Thankfully, <laughs> Noro. Noro was <laughs> no, quick, but it happened quick, ever... and then it ended quick. It was over within 24 hours. <laughs> mm. Last time, so at last least time I had that. Noro... Last time I had Noro, it was like a cleanse. I was I cleansed from inside out. It was, it was oh, beautiful. Oh, yeah. I dropped five pounds. Easy. Yeah. <laughs> it's what we like to call a two-bucket disease. Oh, um, a what? And for those of you that have never heard that phrase, I'll just let that sink in for a little while. A two-button like disease? Two-bucket. Oh, two-bucket. Oh. Two-bucket. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. I like so. to call it double dragon. <laughs> There's also that. Okay, this is TMI, but la- I, I, my poop turned green last time. It oh, was horrific. Whoa. Yeah. Oh wow. That sounds fun. That that I mean, is awful. Were you yeah, drinking distinctly Gatorade? unpleasant. <laughs> no, I, I don't know what okay. happened, and I had a cold as well, so everything coming out of me was green. It was just disgusting. <laughs> I just, uh, <laughs> I, just <laughs> I may, I may edit some of this out. Please. Um, but, but then again, maybe not. I actually I don't, don't care. That's fine. <laughs> oh boy. It's all good. So on a lighter note, what is everyone drinking tonight? I have to do a trigger warning tonight? at the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> I have to do a trigger warning at the beginning of this yeah. episode. Um, I am <laughs> drinking. I was just delivered um, by a friend of mine a um, tre- Troegs or Treggs. I'm not quite sure how to pronounce this brewery. Um, Trog- Scratch Trogues? series number Trogues? 284. Is it Trogues? It might be Trogues. I know it's from Hershey, Pennsylvania, right? Yeah, exactly. I wish um, Jordan were here. He could tell us what it's called. <laughs> but it's T R. O umlaut EGS. Um, and it's the Scratch series 284 Raspberry Goza, mm. which um it's got a nice little subtle raspberry flavor. It's a little bit sour, tart. It's real tasty. Lovely. Sounds delish. Camilla, what about you? So today, as a change, I'm not drinking alcohol. So because it's incredibly warm in Boston today. Uh, it's like a, a nice summer day the weather no snow no nothing and so i'm drinking i'm a little dehydrated so i'm drinking a um, swedish concoction um, called resorb which is like a f- type of gatorade ish you put a little tablet in water and if anyone who knows me this is what i swear by if you get sick or dehydrated or work out i have a resorb where, where can you pick that stuff up in Sweden, so let me know next time I go. <laughs> I have at least like Perfect. four people that I supply with resorb from Sweden <laughs> when I come back. <laughs> Is it just like a powder or something that you? Yeah, it's like a little tablet. Water, you put, yeah, a little tablet you put in water, and uh, it's magic. Like like Alka Seltzer, Alka Seltzer or uh, emergency. Like and maybe more like noon. Do you know this like N U U N or something like this? Have you seen it? Never heard of it. No, <laughs> no, I don't think okay. so. Nope. Okay. Well, it works really Weird well. Scandinavian magic. It is. It is <laughs> awesome <laughs> for norovirus. What about you, Kate? And what, are you... <laughs> <laughs> so, what are you drinking, Kate? I am still in California and three hours ahead or behind you guys, so I'm not drinking yet. Oh, sure. Yep. It's technically, the work day. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, in celebration of my triumphant return to suburbia, (laughs) I now live three minutes away from a Costco. So last night I went to Costco and I bought a giant cheesecake and I'm having a slice of cheesecake. Good for (laughs) you. That sounds awesome. (laughs) I I think... Soon enough, sugar is going to be classified as an intoxicating substance. So, oh, of course, that feels that feels um, appropriate. Yeah. Fair, yeah. yeah, very fair. And I am drinking a Rolling Rock because I'm with Camilla. It's a gorgeous day today. It was like 73 in Connecticut. So you decided to celebrate by drinking brewed urine. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Knew that was coming. Cool. Excuse me. What? It, what is this? Rolling Rock. You never heard of it? No. It's cheap, and it comes in a really pretty green bottle. And it's. I don't know. It tastes like gross. summer to me. Okay. <laughs> it's Fine. like Camilla. Give me a reference. It's here. like someone <laughs> took a Pabst Blue Ribbon oh, and no, decided to not- water it down. <laughs> 
oh, and no. then spit into it. It is oh, not no. as bad as Pabst. I, I completely I like, disagree. Okay. <laughs> Whoa, okay. One, PBR is a wonderful beer. I don't know why we're taking shots at PBR. <laughs> it did nothing to any of you guys. But give you a refreshing beer for a very affordable price. But... <laughs> Rolling Rock, I feel, is is more bitter than um, than it a is. PBR is, it, and like yes. a little more stringent almost, but but refreshing, like refreshing, like maybe a gin drink would be. Sure, <laughs> <laughs> there you go. It's like the gin of beers, and that's why I like it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So martini, the, Rolling Rock, Rolling Rock, Rolling Rock is served in a or it's bottled in a green bottle. Yes. And the reason that most beer is served in a brown bottle is because most beer has compounds in it that when uh, struck by light, they can be um, chemically altered and produce off flavors. Mm. Uh, Rolling Rock just processes all of the taste out of their beer um, <laughs> so they can serve it into a, in a green bottle. Um, Some so people you're drinking say they are yellow, ensuring carbonated, a consistent product. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay uh, i'll shut up now. now we've bashed my beer shall we talk about a paper <laughs> yes <laughs> before we get to the paper i think we should thank our uh, patreon subscribers um who are donating every episode that comes out and we're 87 percent of the way towards having two hosts beer paid for each episode and for the love of god donate so that we can get chadine <laughs> some actually drinkable beverage <laughs> Um, I think that's quite important. Um, we don't have any rewards yet for our Patreon subscribers because none of you have reached out to us and told us what you want. So uh, you should first go. <laughs> Thank you so much, Look, but you have not done you your something. homework. <laughs> I'm you just saying. Like, I'm but happy. I'm just saying, get your act together and give us some more things. Like some ideas I'm happy we to, to give take you your back. money and not give you anything other than podcast episodes. Totally cool with that. But if you want some other thing, I don't know extra content that we might be able to provide um uh thank you from kate um she'll probably just yell at you and insult you but you know <laughs> some people you? might be into I'm that a lovely person um, what are you talking about <laughs> <laughs> well i figure because you always insult me and because i'm so nice to you that must mean the people who you like you just insult constantly i don't think that's true i think i have many many witnesses to the opposite fact and I feel like you're very antagonistic towards me, Kevin. So I don't know where this is. I hear so nice to me. It's coming from. Don't have any idea what you're talking about because I just edit out all the parts where I mean to. Um, so no one will ever know. Um, but anyway, thank you to our Patreon subscribers. Um, in addition to finding us at patreon.com slash audio immunity. And if you are like two of the hosts on this podcast that didn't realize um, what our actual name was, it's auto. I can't even say it now. It is audio immunity. Same number of syllables as autoimmunity, but it's audio immunity. Isn't it clear? It couldn't be more clear. Stay tuned after the episode for a wonderful bloopers reel of Chadine attempting to introduce this episode. Um, <laughs> For the first time. I put her on the spot, so it's not her fault. But yeah, now we can get to the paper. All righty. We have an extra M. That's the problem. Mm. That's Immunity has two M's. Yeah, but if you look, if we're taking the first M of immunity and like just kind of dropping it to make way for the last syllable of audio, we have an extra M in the way that we spell audio immunity. Because you're saying that the, the first M of immunity should be attached to the I? Yeah. Yeah, because you... Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Well, too late now. <laughs> it's only been it's only been four years, and now just, you're just now bringing oh, you this know up. What? Spell check, please. <laughs> Interesting. It, oh well. well. Learn something new every day. Shadine, you're on. So the paper I chose for this evening is from a lab uh, from the Salk Institute for Biological Studies in La Jolla, California. Uh, and the reason I picked this paper is because the PI from this lab, Janelle Ayers, uh, was featured in a stat article. It's actually about a year old now. It was published last May, uh, written by Usha Lee McFarling, uh, which caught my attention because the tagline in this article was essentially that she feels like we shouldn't have to fight infections. We should learn to live with them. Um, and she has a really compelling backstory. Her father passed away of sepsis, and it sounds like she was in graduate school at the time. Uh, and so this sort of drove her desire to learn better ways that we can learn to battle things like superbugs, because she feels like we're losing, and I would agree, we're losing the war on the superbug uh, as far as antibiotics are concerned. Uh, and what really caught my attention about this was that 
apparently uh, her early work sort of caused a lot of controversy in the field. And so not being an immunologist, I'm really hoping that some of you guys can maybe explain what's so controversial about this. Uh, but essentially what it boils down to is semantics. So it's a shame Matt's not on tonight because he really wanted to have an argument about semantics, he said. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to take his place because he and I can go. Uh, toe for I'll, toe. I'll just pretend that I know what Matt was going to say I, and I, can I make just, his argument for him. I may have read not the correct. I read the one that was on air table and it's about anorexia. Was that not the right one? That's the correct one. That's the yep. right one. No, you're, you're okay, right. I'm just good. setting it up. That's right. All right. Yep. Cool. I just didn't see that. So essentially uh, what the controversy boils down to in this case uh, is back when she was in graduate school, her work was focused on studying, uh, it looks like she studied 10,000 flies harboring various genetic mutations and she infected them with listeria, listeria monocytogenes. Uh, but instead of looking for specific immune responses in these flies, she asked a simple question. She asked simply which flies survived the infection and what allowed them to survive. And she and her uh, her mentor, da uh, David Schneider, Schneider uh, at Stanford, uh, coined this survival ability tolerance or the tolerance defense system. And this apparently is the linchpin for the controversy. Apparently this angered a lot of purists because tolerance has a very technical meaning uh, in immunology. And that's what I'm hoping somebody maybe can chime in on and explain. Yeah. So, so typically um, tolerance refers to um, the ability of the immune system to not respond to a thing. So um, one really uh, straightforward example of this is something called LPS tolerance. So LPS is lipopolysaccharide, which is present in the outer membrane of a lot of different uh, bacteria. And if you take a macrophage and you stimulate it with LPS, it will respond. It'll kick out a bunch of cytokines um, and do a bunch of other nasty things that are designed to um, kill off that bacterium. Um, but if you come back like 24 hours later and you stimulate it with LPS again, it will have a very different and non-inflammatory response, or at least, you know, that's the sort of paradigm. Um, and so that is referred to as tolerance. In a an adaptive immune setting, oftentimes when we're talking about tolerance, we're talking about um, pathogens that are not responded to or things that are not responded to by the adaptive immune system. So you might have T cell tolerance or B cell tolerance. And that just means that you have something that might otherwise cause an immune response, but is not causing an immune response. Got it. Does that? Yep. That clears it Camilla, up. Does that? Uh, that That's perfect. Co yep. Concord with your. Okay. Yes. Okay. So what do you make of this controversy? Do you think that they used the term out of place? Do you think there's room for expanding the definition? Well, maybe you should describe a little bit more exactly what they're calling tolerance. Well, we'll get into that with the paper then. Um, <laughs> basically, I think the idea was that they're using the term not on immune cells necessarily, but on other things going on in the body, right? So you just described this as how immune cells are not responding or choosing not to respond um, to describe tolerance. In this case, they're sort of taking the focus off immune cells altogether. My understanding mm -hmm. was that was what sort of set people off. But she has the support of Ruslan Mezditov, so I think she's fine, <laughs> personally. <laughs> I guess um, it's all, it's all so context dependent. See. I mean, definitely not an expert on, on this particular topic, but I would say that immunologists don't have necessarily the claim to the word tolerance. But if you talk about tolerance in the context of an immune response, then How dare that you? has How a definition. How dare you, <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> makes a very fair point, though, because that the term tolerance is used in exactly the same way in plant biology to describe infected plants that stay healthy enough to bear fruit under adverse conditions. Mm. So. Yeah, but I think we've had this conversation on autoimmunity before. No one cares anything about what plant biologists think. <laughs> no! I love See, plant this is biology. Exactly Thank you, Chading. That was a shot at me. <laughs> I studied plant biology as an undergrad. This is exactly what I'm talking about, Kevin. Antagonistic. <laughs> will this get cut out? We will see. I, I actually, I actually really love uh, plant biology, and I think the previous episode we had about plant-based immunity, I think everyone agreed that we should do more plant immunology. Let's do it. Um, and we even had on. Pamela Ronald to talk about her work uh, going back decades now where she's studying innate immune responses in plants and she complained that no one cares about plant immunity. So that's a shame. Yeah. yeah. Change that. I, so I, th I think what part of the issue with tolerance is it's being used in two different contexts. So there's the immune tolerance that Kevin was talking about. And then there's tolerance, which is relating to the fitness of a host. So you have the infection occurring, you have Immune response is occurring, but overall, you know, you don't see a decrease in fitness of that host that's infected. And so it's like an issue of scale. 
I think. So you can think of tolerance occurring as like a single cell, like the immune um, immune tolerance or tolerance of a host being able to survive and still like go through its you know daily functions while being infected. So, yeah, I mean, I think if you if you used a term like the host is able to tolerate the infection, yeah. I feel like that's the meaning yeah. that they're going for here. And, right. And I think which that, it seems like that idea is um, has been around in ecology host parasite relationship for a really long time. And this paper will, will touch on that, which is the idea of um, an intermediate virulence. So having a bug. So. If you have an infection of a host, you don't want to be so virulent, so detrimental to the host's health and fitness that the host dies immediately before your replication. If you're the bug, the replication cycle is completed and transmission has occurred. But you don't want to have such a low impact on the host that you can't or have such a, yeah, I guess impact on the host fitness that you can't um, get the... um, you know, the energy, the molecules that the host is providing to actually finish your replication. So there's this, um, there's a spot that these parasites try to hit of being virulent enough to replicate, but not so virulent that they can't transmit or finish replication. And so mm-hmm. tolerance plays into that. So if the host can tolerate that, that replication cycle, that, that infection, it's beneficial for both the host and the parasite. Very good intro to the paper, actually. That's exactly what this paper is going to talk about. So let's dig into it. For the readers out there listening and reading along, the paper is uh, Pathogen-Mediated Inhibition of Anorexia Promotes Host Survival and Transmission, uh, published in Cell in January uh, 2017. And the first author on this paper is Sheila Rao uh, and Janelle Ayers, as I said. Uh, Ayers? Ayers? Anybody Ayers? have any thoughts? Ayers? Janelle Ayers no is the uh, the PI on this paper. Uh, so let's dig into it. Is everybody good with that? Yeah. Yes. All right. Yep. Let's get going. Uh, so basically what they're going to look at in this paper uh, is they're going to focus on the idea that infections trigger certain behavioral changes, things like anorexia, which is the focus of this paper, fever, sleep disturbances, social withdrawal. These are called sickness behaviors. Uh, and these are thought to be adaptive strategies that increase the odds of survival on an individual level. But this is probably context dependent. Uh, Case in point, uh, a little bit of contradictory research, they've shown that mice that are infected with listeria uh, and then force fed end up succumbing to more rapid death versus those mice that are allowed to develop an anorexic response. Uh, In contrast, Drosophila or fruit flies uh, that are infected with listeria, in that case, anorexia is actually maladaptive for surviving the infection. Right. So. I, so we should just say that listeria is a uh, typical foodborne pathogen um, that gives you an intestinal infection. I don't know. Are, are fruit flies the, the native host for listeria or are they a native host? I feel like fruit flies probably aren't getting infected with listeria all that often. Yeah, but probably you, you jab them in the abdomen in a research setting. You can give them listeria. Right. right. So there could be other explanations, but the idea is that, you know, it's probably context dependent. You know, every infection, every host might be a little bit different uh, as far as these behaviors are concerned. But the point of this paper is that they want to understand this better. Uh, And there's a good reason for that. Modern medicine tends to interfere with sickness behaviors, right? When people get hospitalized with infections, um, you know, we do things like supportive care measures and uh, nutrient feeding via IV. And so it's a good idea that we have maybe a better handle on what exactly we're doing and how that's impacting uh, the virulence of the pathogen that the person is infected with. And so specifically in this paper, they're going to look at how the fasted state or anorexic state functionally influences host resistance and tolerance defenses, but also microbial virulence. That's sort of the crux of this paper. Um, and, And it's important to note that pathogens and the microbiota, the normal flora, are dependent on the energy intake of their hosts. Theory has been that anorexia tends to lead to a less hospitable niche for pathogens, that you're sort of starving them of nutrients, uh, but the opposite could also be true. So acute starvation in humans is associated with increased risk of invasive bacterial infections, uh, and that may or may not be due to poor immune status, but it could be due, in fact, to increased invasiveness and virulence on the pathogens part of this, uh, which is an adaptive strategy for these microbes under nutrient-limiting conditions. Uh, 
so basically, this paper sets out to sort of explore this uh, using uh, Salmonella and Terica cirivar typhimerium. A cirivar is a serological variant. It's like a, a serotype, is my understanding, in bacteria. Um, and Salmonella specifically has more than 2,600 different serotypes. Uh, so the one they're focused on, typhimerium, is a nasty one. This one causes enteric and systemic typhoid-like disease. Uh, a brief overview of its life cycle, uh, it infects you uh, via the fecal-oral route. So you get infection orally, uh, salmonella invades intestinal epithelial cells, uh, specifically these specialized M cells, uh, which are cells of the mucosa-associated lymphoid tissues. And then once the bacteria gets into the lamina propria, uh, they are engulfed by innate immune cells, and then infection of these cells induces infiltration of T and B cells specifically. Uh, and the gut phase in mice in this paper, uh, important to note in this paper, includes an anorexic response. So this is this is a valid, the mice are a valid model to model what's going on in human beings. So essentially, this paper is looking at how sickness-induced anorexia affects infection-induced lethality in mice. Can I just, can I just pause for a moment sure. and say it's, it's really funny to me that you went through the whole life cycle thing because that feels like a very virologist thing to do. <laughs> I'm um, sorry. I can't help and, it. Uh, <laughs> You're just you're just showing your stripes. I feel like <laughs> most immunologists slash like microbiologists wouldn't bother with any of that crap. Yeah, they're just so, like, eh, who cares? <laughs> I mean, I think it's super useful. Like it's yes. going to be super critical to understanding this paper. But I feel like um, it just it feels like a every virology uh, talk I ever went to. It was like the first thing you do is talk Here's about the, the life, life cycle, cycle of the pathogen. No, that's right. It's yep. drummed um, into us. <laughs> yep. Anyway, sorry for that digression. Like no, nope, it's that fine. Tradition and do it right in the middle of the talk. Yep, there you go. <laughs> that, shake it all up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, so let's jump right into figure one. Uh, so going into figure one, basically they're going to focus on a specific salmonella effector protein. And in this case, that protein is SLRP. Do we pronounce this slurp? <laughs> oh, oh God, yes. 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 <laughs> yes. yes. It Just the salmonella slurp. slurp. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. That was very fancy. No, oh. please, no. Please, for the love of God, no. <laughs> so this slurp protein... Okay, that's it's a little weird. Slurpee? We'll just go. We'll go. No, I like Slurpee. It. I like that even. Oh, now I want to go to the Seven Eleven. Um, all right, we're gonna call it SLRP. Uh, that, that Slurpee will complement your Rolling Rock quite nicely. I feel delicious. All right, so uh, SLRP is an effector protein of Salmonella. It is classified as a novel E3 ubiquitin ligase class protein, and these are traditionally thought to promote virulence during infection, but they hypothesize here that since uh, some bacteria and salmonella is included in this, can colonize hosts asymptomatically, uh, and they also encode mechanisms to interact with the host ubiquitin system, uh, they hypothesize that maybe SLRP is actually negatively regulating virulence in this system, and they will go on to show this, I think. I think. I think they so we should just say uh, briefly, I think, because um, it's kind of cool. Um, basically, what salmonella and other bugs like it do is they actually live inside the endosomes of macrophages. And while they're in there, they can use something called the type three secretion system to basically inject bacterial proteins into the host cell cytosol. And then those proteins, once they're in the host cell cytosol, can then do fancy things like um, attach ubiquitins to other proteins and um, cause all kinds of crazy things to happen. Um, so that's what this this slurpy protein is doing uh, apparently nice yes you called it slurpy <laughs> yep i did it all right so it's better than slurp i'm just trying to establish <laughs> fine we'll some call standards it here whatever <laughs> So in figure one, they uh, infected specific pathogen-free or SPF uh, black six, six mice orally with a wild-type Salmonella typhimurium strain. But then they also have this deletion mutant uh, that's deleted for slurpy protein. And uh, the first thing they see in panel A is um, they're looking at a percent survival of these mice. The mice infected with the deleted slurpy strain die much faster uh, and much more dramatically than the mice infected a wild type strain. Uh, in panel B and C, they're looking at uh, their percent of initial body weight uh, and essentially this proxy for anorexia. And as you can see, they also lose weight uh, much more rapidly 
and much more dramatically than the mice infected a wild type strain. And then in panels D and E, they further parse out what exactly these mice are losing. Uh, and they see that the mice infected with the deleted Slurpee strain aren't really losing any lean mass, but they are in fact losing their fat stores, their adipose tissue, supporting that this is, this is definitely wasting that they're seeing in this mice. So can, so, we, can we just pause here? Because sure. when, I, when I see this as an immunologist, I just think, okay, in the, the mice that are infected with this mutant slurpy mm -hmm. strain, they somehow have a defective immune response towards the strain, and they are not able to fight off the bug, and therefore they're dying. Yeah. And but don't is, you think that's through the sickness behavior, the anorexia? So is the, is is that the argument of the paper uh -huh. that that affects? Okay. So I don't. I'm not. I'm not sure. But when you see it in just an infection model, and you say like, "Oh, this is a sign of infection," I, yeah, I, I was, wonder I was, if, if that's was... just like the if that's just the sickness behavior, the anorexia, all of these. Uh, all these yeah. other behaviors taking effect, yeah. Well, I was confused by the paper because the argument in the intro was kind of like, surprisingly, anorexia led to decreased survival in some cases. And that's the way I interpreted it. And I thought that's not, to me, that's not surprising at all. I would definitely, if you have less food and nutrients around, your immune system just can't do its job to right, fight but, off the but infection. The idea here is is that it's the the pathogen has a a protein that is encoded specifically to prevent the host from being anorexic, right? Right. So, like, typically, if like for most sort of yeah. traditional virulence factors, most of these thing these effector proteins that are uh, injected into host cell cytosol, if you if you knock that protein out, then basically the bug can't survive anymore, right? The like you if you knock the protein out, all of a sudden um, pathogen replication goes way down, and so the host survives. In this case, they're knocking out a protein and if, if it was becoming more um, virulent, got it right. It's becoming more virulent. And if it was if it was because like maybe this is a protein that the immune system needs to detect mm -hmm. the pathogen. And so um, it's just like an effect defective immune response. Like you said, yeah. you'd expect that the pathogen replication would be much higher and that would be leading to death. Got it. Right. But uh, in figure two, you don't actually have increased replication got it. of the bug. Right. right. Excellent. Thank you. Right. So spoiler alert, moving on to figure two. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, jump the no, gun. There. No, no, it's fine. No, that's definitely um, part of the answer for sure because they show that you're right. This is not necessarily the result of increased pathogen burden or uh, reduced or inefficient. Um, but that's sort of so. This was one of those figures, and I felt like this was kind of true of a lot of the figures in this paper, um, where you could just draw a big black line and separate them into two separate figures. They were there were sort of these were massive figures. I thought I don't know if anyone else felt that way, and that some made one point and then some made an entirely different point. But yeah. anyway, that's beside. The point. Um, I, I think that's two, probably. Uh... And it's a cell paper. Well, oh, no, yeah, I was going to say it's I mean, probably like a, a figure limit as someone who just made like a 20 sub panel figure oh, against boy. my will. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> I would That's have loved to put it into three separate figures. But sometimes the but world doesn't work make that a, way for make you. Make a separate paper, just like publish two <laughs> papers. Oh my God. When you run out of letters, you can always use the Swedish alphabet because we have <sighs> three vowels at the end. So oh, extra ones. Fun. So Very nice. You know, if things get dire. <laughs> cool. I'll keep that in mind for my next paper. Oh, man. So I might skim a little bit of this because some of this stuff is a little uh, extra. But basically, um, so they look at respiratory response rate, which is which is basically a, a proxy for whether the mice are preferentially burning fat versus carbs, uh, which backs up the wasting data. And sure enough, uh, the slurpy deleted infected mice that did not come out right. The mice infected with the deleted slurpy strain uh, had decreased respiratory response rate, indicating that they were, in fact, burning fat. And then in panel B, uh, again, now we're looking at uh, their food consumption, so anorexia. Uh, both the wild-type infected and the, de the deleted slurpee-infected mice ate less. Uh, but again, this response was more severe in the, the mice infected with the deleted slurpee strain within the first 24 hours. Uh, and it was 6% less uh, then the wild type infected mice at 24 hours and then 20% less between 24 and 48 hours. So this is pretty uh, pronounced. Uh, and so back to the question Camilla was asking, you know, they're asking whether or not this is the result of increased pathogen burden or uh, does this particular strain, the, the deletion strain grow faster? Is it cleared less efficiently? Uh, so in C, now they're looking at uh, the pathogen burden in all the target tissues for salmonella infection. 
So we've got small intestine, cecum, colon, uh, PP, that's Peyer's patches. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Mesenteric lymph nodes, spleen and liver. uh, And it's really comparable all the way across the board. There's there's no increased pathogen burden. uh, And this is at both 24 and 48 hours. Uh, They looked at the dissemination index to the, you know, disseminated infection to the spleen and the liver. uh, And this is at 48 hours. And again, they're not seeing any increased uh, extra intestinal dissemination. Uh, and then finally, they ask, uh, does Slurpee change, does the Delta Slurpee strain change the microbiota in any appreciable way? Uh, so again, now we're looking at uh, food consumption, and these are now in germ-free mice, uh, and they compared uh, these mono-infected mice wild-type strain to the deleted Slurpee strain, uh, showing the same exact results. They're seeing the anorexia in the mice infected with the, the deleted Slurpee strain and not in the wild-type. So it's not the microbiota that are having this effect. Uh, so. Um, Basically, uh, going on from here, you know, we know now that this more severe anorexic response is not due to increased pathogen burden, extra intestinal dissemination, tissue tropism, et cetera, et cetera. Well, what about the host nutrient status? So in panels F, G, H, and I, now we're looking at uh, mice that were going to be food restricted or fed ad libitum. So ad libitum is actually the technical term in these kinds of studies for mice that are free fed. They're fed ad lib or at one's pleasure. I like to eat ad libitum myself. <laughs> um, food pellets too? Mouse pellets? <laughs> Human pellets. Okay. Uh, <laughs> sort of like green pellets. No. <laughs> So basically, I just uh, beard brew for the first time this past weekend, and beard one brew? of the things that you, you just what I I just brewed beer this past <laughs> weekend for the first time. I'm sorry if I miss said that earlier. You said beard and brew. one of the things you can use is um, is hops pellets. Ooh. So rather than using like whole hops, you just add in these little pellets, and they look exactly like what you feed to rabbits. That's great, that's gross. And that's in Which my beard. Which means that now. they look exactly what a rabbit leaves behind. That's true oh. too. Oh yes. God, lovely, <laughs> nice. Okay, moving right along. So uh, in panel F, what we're looking at here is they've got mice that were infected with the wild type strain, mice that were infected with the deleted Slurpee strain, and then they had mice that they infected with wild type strain and then restricted their feeding. And as you can see in panel F, uh, all the way across, they are dem- now demonstrating, the mice that were infected with the wild type strain and then restricted are now demonstrating the same uh, anorexic response as the mice infected with the deleted Slurpee strain. And you can see that by body weight, uh, their survival also tanks. So that's panel G. These mice do- drop like flies um, or like infected mice uh, <laughs> to the same <laughs> level as the mice infected with the deleted Slurpee strain do. And then uh, the inverse of that is that uh, panel H and I, now they're comparing infection of uh, mice with the wild type strain, mice with the deleted Slurpee strain, and then mice with the deleted Slurpee strain, and they force fed these mice. And as you can see, the effect is not quite as pronounced, but now we've got the flip of that. Now the mice that are being force fed are uh, looking much more like the mice that were infected with the wild type strain, uh, and their survival stats are much more compelling. These mice uh, definitely are uh, surviving far better when they're being forced fed in this case i have to say like this this series of panels is like super convincing to me Mm -hmm. because it's i agree it's sort of one of the things like sort of the traditional experiment that you might do uh to make sure a gene is doing what you think it is is you like delete the gene and then see a uh, see some phenotype go away or uh appear and then you like add the gene Reintroduce back it, right? yeah. um, yep. into the mutant. And so this is like that, except rather than like adding the gene back, they're actually just changing the behavior in ways. So they're like using uh, food restriction and basically it equals the phenotype of the knockout. And then with the knockout, they force feed, which is like a behavior complement. Yep. And they reduce the effect. It's just like, this is super, it's beautiful. super it's awesome really nicely and done. convincing. I find, yeah, and I find it interesting in H and I that you know, when they force feed the mutant uh, mutant infected mice, they're, they're not able to restore the, the weight all the way back, but they do restore its survival mm-hmm. just back to yeah, the wild Yeah, that's interesting, level. isn't it? I agree. So yeah. it's really, I mean, the survival, I would say here is more convincing than the the weight change so yes i agree agree. yeah yeah it may be that the weight changes are more a metric of how well the force feeding was going on but you did make you did feed enough to get the survival benefit just that the survival benefit is not as closely tied to the amount of weight that is actually lost 
So you're yeah. still supplying the nutrients, even though they're not getting the weight back. Right. And, and it might also Kevin, be that there's something else going on there that's like, you can't, like, yeah, affecting how it infects. Sorry, Shadina, I cut you off. Uh, I was just going to say, um, you know, coming back to Kevin's point about this being sort of a behavioral complementation, I'll just point out that um, I, I didn't read the supplement very closely. I skimmed it, but they also do the the um, actual gene genetic complementation in this case, and they get the same results. So really, really thorough work. That was something that impressed me about this paper is they thought of everything and they nailed all of these experiments. I thought it was nicely done. So moving on to figure three. Uh, so from this, you know, up to this point, what we've got now is that reduced nutrient intake seems to lead to increased virulence. So their hypothesis here is that Slurpee directly interacts with host physiologies that negatively regulate sickness-induced anorexic response. So in figure three, uh, now we're going to look at some canonical mediators of sickness-induced anorexia. So in panel A, um, they're, they're looking at uh, the activity levels of the mice just to make sure that it's not that, you know, the mice that are anorexic are less active and that that's the cause. Um, and apparently what this shows is that these mice are all equally active during their light-dark cycles, um, which is interesting. And they're nocturnal, uh, which I forgot for a second. They're, they're <laughs> nocturnal. Yeah, oh, so yeah, they are. The activity right. goes up oh, at night. Yes. I was like, oh, yep. that's kind of weird. Maybe there's, st-. and I'm like, no, no, they're nocturnal, Kate. That's wow. Some nice. I didn't know that about mice. That's yeah. really, they really are. That's so weird. Which is why circadian rhythm experiments are really awful to do as oh, a human boy. being because you have to, if you have to do anything during their active cycle, it's during your sleepy cycle. So, oh no. Yeah, except that most of them are in facilities where they can, like, if you're actually doing yes. circadian yes. rhythm yes. research, you they can just like make the mice them. think yes. that it's dark when it's yeah. not. Yeah, I guess it was. Yeah. I was speaking from personal grudge of my first uh, <laughs> year as a grad student, <laughs> where I had a, a pilot, uh, some pilot experiments with circadian rhythm, and our animal facilities was shared and could not be switched over. And um, I had to start my experiments at 8 p.m. in the evening. And oh then Jesus! There, that is awful. Aren't there papers that say that the circ- switching them off to a, like a new circadian rhythm really doesn't work anyway? That like trying to um, to to switch them that there's some there's still some signaling that is occurring on like the original circadian rhythm even when you switch them over like days oh, later weeks later. I might have made that up. <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure you made that up. <laughs> okay. I mean, it may not be super fast, but um, the, so it is definitely the case that there are multiple different clocks, and sometimes yeah. some of them reset faster than others. Yeah. Um, I should caveat this by saying basically all of my knowledge of circadian rhythms comes from a single course I took in college, like 15 years ago now. Um, yeah, I'm gonna but, let that so you're one an expert. Pat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Totally. I'll, I'll um, rely on my sketchy memory. <laughs> of this like interest it was in a seminar can i just put it <laughs> okay can, can i just put in a little a little um circadian rhythm trivia for for the peoples oh, so fun. of course yeah uh, the circadian rhythm um won the nobel prize last year so the right. discovery of the circadian genes and it so happens that my lab mate marie siwiki her mother was postdoc's work was one of the papers cited for the wow. Nobel Prize. So nice. We have some that's so cool immunology connections to this work. So. Very nice. <laughs> Just very, very. I know someone. Very who very. Knows uh, someone <laughs> who went to the Nobel Prize dinner. Hey, <laughs> that's awesome. Though. But, but the fact that you're from Sweden means that you know everybody that won the Nobel Prize, right? Sure. Yes. Yes. Of course. I go to all she the dinners. She hands the okay. medals out. Yeah. Haven't you watched them on? You know. Yeah. TV? <laughs> I'm right there next to the king in the beautiful That's right. dress. Mm-hmm. That's me. They're BFF. <laughs> <laughs> totally makes sense. Yeah. Okay, so uh, so back to figure three. Uh, the long and short of this figure is they basically checked all of the possibilities for how the uh, deleted Slurpee strain could possibly be causing this increased anorexia. Uh, but what they found is that it's not uh, alleviating, Slurpee doesn't seem to be alleviating tissue damage, at least in the case with wild type infect- infection. So tissue damage is the same in all of the target organs. Uh, it's not increasing total cellularity or any of the specific uh, cell infiltrate subtypes uh, in any of the ones they looked at. So they looked at T cells, B cells, neutrophils, phagocytic max, etc. DCs, and they weren't seeing any increases. Uh, and they also looked at uh, some cytokines, uh, specifically TNF alpha and IL six, uh, which I think are are known for being um, 
some of the, the major cytokines that are known for modulating sickness-induced behavioral changes, no changes there either. Uh, so basically, Slurpee's not inhibiting the anorexic response by alleviating any of the primary causes of disease or inhibiting induction of any of the cytokines or immune cells that are involved in this response. So what the hell is it doing? Uh, so moving on to figure four, uh, and I'll sort of summarize this one fairly quickly, quickly as well, I think. Uh, this one's kind of cool. So basically, uh, systemic IL-1 beta is believed to be the predominant mediator of sickness-induced anorexia. Uh, so in this figure, they introduce a new mouse, and this one is an IL-1 beta mouse, a beta, uh, IL-1 beta knockout mouse, excuse me, uh, so that they can sort of tease apart this idea that systemic IL-1 beta might be uh, the main driver of this anorexic response in the infections. Uh, so the first thing they did was they compared the levels of mature IL-1 beta uh, using a reporter assay in the liver, the spleen, uh, the serum, and the small intestine. The only place that they see a difference in the induction of mature IL-1 beta uh, is in the small intestine, uh, and they see higher levels of IL-1 beta uh, in response to uh, the deleted Slurpee uh, infection at both 24 hours and 48 hours, more pronounced at 48 hours. And this was specific to the small intestine because they checked all throughout the digestive tract tissues, and it's the only place they saw this increase. So, so I should say here that like this this looks much more like a, a sort of traditional bacterial effector paper mm -hmm. where you have the in, basically the inhibition of the production of an inflammatory cytokine. And under most circumstances, if, if you're like blocking the production of some cytokine, like if you were blocking TNF or IL-6 or something, you'd expect like, oh, yeah, that's because those drive an immune response that limit pathogen growth. Mm -hmm. And like that totally makes sense. And that's like you know, been done in a billion papers. I think the thing that's so interesting about this is that despite the fact that you have such decreased IL-1 beta production, as we saw before, there's not actually an increase in pathogen very or in pathogen growth right. burden. Right. All all this seems to be doing is driving the the feeding behavior. Yep. Um and so it, it's like a traditional effector paper except for the outcome of uh what this cytokine is yeah, doing. Yeah, that was really cool. surprising to me too. I was I was like, shouldn't IL-1 beta be good against this uh, infection? Or did I flip that in my mind now? No, no. that's, that's okay. right. That's right. <laughs> <Good>. yeah. <laughs> So then uh, when they orally infect these IL-1 beta knockout mice with the deleted uh, Slurpee bacteria, uh, they don't develop anorexia as badly as uh, the B6 mice do uh, based on food consumption. So okay, we're looking at panel B. Uh, and they have reduced weight loss, reduced wasting, panel C, and it increased survival, panel D. So By a lot. By yeah, a lot. By a no, lot. yeah. I mean, it looks like a regular mouse infected with the wild type strain here. It's really, uh, really kind of an impressive result. Um, so then um, they do the inverse of this again. Now they inject a wild type uh, infected B6 mice, so not the IL-1 beta knockout, but the regular B6 mouse with the recombinant IL-1 beta. And now they recapitulate the phenotype of increased uh, anorexia and increased morbidity and weight loss in these mice. So that's panels uh, E and F in this case. So what this shows here is that IL-1 beta is sufficient to induce anorexia. And that this suggests that Slurpee inhibits IL-1 beta uh, in the small intestine, which leads to reduced anorexia and reduced virulence in the wild type infection. And then uh, finally, they're sort of looking at upstream of this at the, the driver of this. So that's we're looking in... Uh, uh, panel G. Um, so the backstory here is uh, when you get uh, infection in the leukocytes in the lamina propria, you get expression of pro IL-1 beta uh, and also activation of the inflammasome. And the inflammasome activation uh, leads to the cleavage and activation of caspase 1. And then this leads to the cleavage and activation of pro IL-1 beta into active IL-1 beta. So that's the pathway there. So now they're looking in panel G upstream to caspase 1. Uh, and what they see is increased caspase 1 cleavage uh, from the deleted Slurpee strain at 48 hours. So looking down at the bottom panel. Uh, uh, and this, you know, this 48 hour time point is associated with an increase uh, in the level of IL-1 beta in the small intestine. intestine. Uh, and specifically, they see this in the lamina propria. They're not seeing this cleavage in the IECs, the uh, intestinal epithelial cells. Um, and H is just qPCR confirming that they see uh, no difference in the IL-1 beta mRNA levels, the expression of IL-1 beta in this case. So this is specifically coming from the cleavage of caspase 1 into its cleavage products, denoted here as caspase 1p20, if you're following along looking at the Western blot. 
So this suggests that Slurpee regulates IL-1 beta levels by impacting caspase-1 activation specifically uh, and, and inflammasome activation, either directly or indirectly by Slurpee-1 uh, and specifically in these LP myeloid cells. So that's sort of the long and short of figure four. I have to say, it's probably because I haven't done a Western blot in like four years, mm. but I find the Western blot very unimpressive. I do too. <laughs> oh, okay, good. Yeah, well, at least <laughs> at 48 feel... hours, it's hard to... S- I. I was surprised that there was so much cleavage of uh, caspase one in the wild type at forty at forty eight hours. Well, they just yeah. look similar. They look very similar as compared to the from the result from twenty four. Like why forty eight is all of a sudden so much yeah. more. Yeah, I can agree yeah. with that. Mm-hmm. I assumed maybe it's just um, sort of the pixelation we have on our like the. Um, no, I the mean these, these assays ours. are really it's it's the Western blood. I think these assays are really hard, um, and it's it's not a super clean result, but. You know, whatever this this paper isn't about trying to figure out the mechanism of action of um, Slurpee. No. It, that's just kind of a, it feels like a throwaway. Yeah. And you can also yeah. make the argument that the kinetics are more important at 24 hours than 48, right. 48 and blah, sure. blah, blah, blah. Yep. That's true. That's true. But yeah. I do just want to because I know this took me a long time to um, to click into IL-1 beta, not regulated. Well, it is regulated transcriptionally, but the activity is not regulated transcriptionally. So if you're looking at no. the H sub panel and you're like, I don't get it. That's a control to know. Th- so you know that transcriptionally they're the same. So it's the processing right. that's different. So it's the activity right. of caspase one that's different. Right. That exactly. took me an embarrassing long time to like be able to click in. So... <laughs> No, it's valid. There's a lot going on. Are you saying just now or like in the course of your <laughs> no, uh, no, immunology no. education? I mean, I mean uh, no, not now. <laughs> I think that's drilled into my head pretty, uh, pretty strongly okay. at this point. But just I remember like as a first year grad student staring at a figure for an, uh, longer than maybe necessary. Just wanted to throw that up. <laughs> I just I feel like someone is staring at it, had the question. And being like, and like what like, are they talking there. about? <laughs> mm-hmm. Nope. Good point. Very good point. So moving into figure five, this is where I think the paper starts to get really cool. And I think maybe it's just because I have absolutely no experience in the idea of exploring the gut brain axis or anything like that. Um, But I thought this figure was kind of neat, even though it doesn't necessarily hammer home a home run here. But bear with me. Um, So basically, they're going back to those IL-1 beta knockout mice here. We know they don't develop anorexia and that they're less susceptible to the deleted Slurpee uh, strain infection. Um, and uh, what we're looking at here is they they infect these mice and then they put them under food restricted conditions. And now when they do that, they see greater virulence uh, than the, for the mice that are fed ad lib. So this is panel A we're looking at. Uh, and again, uh, correspondingly, when we look at survival, um, you know, we see... Uh, much less uh, or no morbidity uh, compared to, or I'm sorry, the opposite of that. We see much more uh, mor- mor- morbidity, more death in these mice uh, when they're food restricted specifically. Um, so, and this is one of those examples where I feel like we kind of shift gears now. They um, decide to explore what this means sort of upstream. So in the absence of IL-1 beta, food restriction is sufficient to increase virulence of this strain. This suggests that virulence is regulated by IL-1 beta control of feeding behaviors, which ties them into the central nervous system, the CNS, somehow. That was sort of a black box for me, but okay, I'll go with it. So in panel C, we're looking at a heat map now where they explore the gene expression analysis of in the hypothalamus uh, between mice infected with the wild type strain and mice infected with the deleted Slurpee strain. And as you can see, um, there's huge differential gene expression. And they say that the genes that they're focused on here, and again, in the qPCR and panel D, uh, these are genes that are specifically involved in feeding and satiety. Um, So you see big changes uh, between these genes in these genes in in these mice that are infected with different strains. Um, This is where it gets kind of cool. You can sever the visceral afferent nerves and abolish sickness behaviors and anorexia in mice that are injected with LPS, for example, or IL-1 beta. Um, So they know that this vagus nerve is important for transmitting info about distal inflammatory states to the brain. So they vagotomized mice, which I think is fascinating, uh, and their control are uh, sham vagotomy, so like sham surgery. Does anybody know exactly what that involves? Do you literally open up the mouse and then do nothing and sew it back up? Correct. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And you, you keep them under anesthetic for this, yeah. basically the same period of time that it takes you to to cut out the vagus nerve. Um, so you, you basically do everything the same except you don't snip. Very interesting. Okay, cool. 
Uh, well, that's what they did. And what they show here, if you're following along panels E, F, and G, uh, with these vagotomized mice, uh, the deleted Slurpee strain no longer induces anorexia compared to the surgical sham mice. Uh, and the IL-1 beta-dependent gene expression signature was also dependent on this vagus nerve, which is panel F. So that's qPCR again for those specific genes that we saw in panel D. But the uh, the uh, IL-1 beta activation in the in the small intestine uh, during infection is not affected by the vagus nerve. So we're looking at small intestine at 48 hours post-infection here in panel G. So um, there's no difference here. It's not affected by the vagus nerve. And this makes sense because it, uh, the mature IL-1 beta is going to be uh, downstream of the vagus nerve. So there you go. Um, All of this is very cool. I just yeah. want to say one of my pedantic points that I feel like I made a couple weeks ago as well. When you take a plot out of prism and you just take one edge of it and drag it to shrink the plot to make it fit your figure, you're not fooling anyone because your text is all squashed too. We can see it. Don't oh do that. Boy. For the love of God. <laughs> Everyone, it you looks can do so that. terrible. Kevin's crazy. I watched him delete <laughs> so and rewrite all of his, all of the axes oh, labels yeah, sure. in Illustrator. That, that was oh. bananas. I do. I, I do it too. I'm with you, Kevin. You're bananas. You, have to, you, You're you, bananas. you can't. You can't put this kind of figure into like like it. Just it looks so bad. Wait, I'm sorry. It's You're so gonna have obvious. to tell me what panel you're complaining about because I don't see it. <laughs> look at D yep. and F. Are you talking about? And look at the x-axis labels. That bothers you, really? Oh yeah. And it, compare it to G, for example. Like it's just clear that someone brought this into Illustrator or whatever, took the right hand side and dragged it to squish it. But that distorts all of the labels, and it it's it's awful. It's terrible. Does it also you bother you that, that all the Y axes have a different font size? Do you see that, Kevin? Can you see? I do. All the I Y do. axes <laughs> and I can. and the legends. Oh boy. And it drives me nuts. <laughs> I won't lie, but I can get over that because most people aren't anal about that. And I'm fine with that. Kevin, you know, like, that's OK. Kevin, please do not read but, my paper. <laughs> <laughs> I was but putting when, together when the figures. I could text. hear you complaining at me about it as I was doing it. <laughs> oh, it's just it's so it's so bad. It's so bad. Wow. I'm sorry. I just I like this is beautiful science. It's really beautiful science. But when you do this, it just makes me respect you less. I'm sorry. <laughs> Love, do you not I care love enough about your graphs to make the font the same? Do you not? <laughs> like, it's actually it's actually not hard. You can just select all of the text, hit the I button in Illustrator, the eyedropper, and just click some other text that you didn't mess with, and it'll fix it. It's really easy. It requires you do a tutorial. owning Illustrator. I mean, there's no. That. You can do it with Inkscape too, and that's free. Uh, it requires you can do the exact learning. same thing. <laughs> yeah, you can also do it in the like, Keynote and just hide your hide your axes. Like hide the numbers and then make little Kevin's text boxes. Okay put a little white box over it. Well, not <laughs> over it. You you just like uh, mask your your. Kevin axes. doesn't believe that presentation software should be used for uh, image generation. Okay, well, do oh, you, you can correct. look at my my figures in my paper, and if you object to how they they look, then we can talk again. Okay. Okay, but in any ways, it's uh, on. <laughs> <laughs> going back to the beautiful science, I would say what I missed from this figure, and correct me if they had it somewhere else. Else, but the survival and weight loss with the vagotomized mice would have been nice to see that it's not just a food intake difference, but also looking at like whether or not it actually changed survival and weight loss. I want to say that might have been in the supplement, yeah. but I could be wrong about that. Yeah, don't quote me on that. Because like I said, it probably I probably didn't look as good as the rest of the it. stuff. So that's fair. Yeah, because in the earlier figures, the the food or the weight loss wasn't the, the survival was so much more striking yeah. than yeah. the other yeah. metrics. Yeah. True. So. That was my only only complaint about this figure. Otherwise I think it's really cool as well. Yeah, I can't find it in the supplement now. But yeah, good point. All right. So we are almost done, guys. We are on the last figure and half of it's a model anyway. So um, the question they're asking here now is why the increased virulence? So in panel A, they're, they're looking at uh, the dissemination index, comparing wild type infection to the deleted Slurpee infection uh, to wild type that were also injected with um, recombinant IL-1 beta to uh, wild type that were restricted to wild type infected that were restricted to this deleted Slurpee infected force fed mice. Were you following all that, everybody? I hope so. Um, they color coded nicely. Back 15 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, so uh, anyway, what they see, uh, to roughly summarize panel A and panel B, is that they see increased uh, levels of dissemination events to other organs in the case of all of the three in the middle. So the infection with the deleted Slurpee strain, uh, infection with wild type, but also uh, injected with recombinant IL-1 beta, or infection with wild type that is restricted in their diet. So all three of these show increased dissemination. Uh, and in contrast, in panel B, now we're looking at shedding as a proxy for transmission ability, these three also show decreased shedding, right? So you follow increased dissemination, decreased shedding, okay? Uh, so then uh, in panel C, now we're looking at the liver burden in mice that had uh, uh, no shedding events, for example. So on the bottom, we're looking at fecal shedding events, yes or no, uh, and they're comparing uh, the CFU in the liver of these mice, and they see uh, higher levels of CFU in the liver in the mice that have no shedding and lower levels in the mice that have shedding, that have fecal burden. Uh, in panel D, now this is looking at the converse of that. They're looking at, uh, they're comparing uh, CFU and the feces to liver dissemination events. And again, uh, it's the same correlation. Uh, so here's where they really start to bring this paper home. Uh, now in panels E and F, they're looking at a horizontal transmission model here. So they co-house the mice to determine the levels of transmission. So pr wild type primary, that's the primary infected wild type, mouse infected with a wild type strain. And they're co-housed with what they're calling the wild type secondary. And again, if you're following along, these bars are in blue, dark blue and light blue respect, okay? Uh, and in the case of the wild type infected mouse, the secondary animal displayed up to 75% shedding in that case. Conversely, the mouse, the primary mouse that was infected with the deleted Slurpee strain, uh, shown in red, was co-housed now with the deleted Slurpee strain secondary, also a shade of red, perhaps that's pink. Uh, in that case, uh, they only saw 10% shedding in this mouse. So obviously, this particular strain of bacteria is not being transmitted as well to other hosts. Uh, and finally, in panel F, now they're looking at survival. And again, uh, in the case of the secondarily infected uh, deleted Slurpee strain mouse, they see reduced mortality, uh, arguably due to reduced transmission via shedding. So that is all of the data. We can summarize the model for everybody uh, following along if they'd like to, and then make some final points. Um, I'll, I'll stick the model in the show notes. Just do that, um, then read it yourselves, folks. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go home. <laughs> um, basically, just to sort of summarize yes, their please. model. The idea is that this Slurpee effector protein uh, is preventing the, in some way, and this is one of my criticisms, they don't get it. Well, it's not really a criticism because what more could they have stuffed into this paper? Uh, but Slurpee is some way directly having an impact on uh, the activation of IL-1, mature IL-1 beta through the caspase-1 uh, pathway, which prevents uh, triggering of the vagus nerve leading to feeding networks in the hypothalamus, and therefore these mice don't develop anorexia, and that this is at a, a trade-off to salmonella virulence, so the strain is less virulent. However, this is really good for salmonella transmission and also good for host survival. So it's sort of on the individual level, a win-win. Win for the person who is infected, win for the person, who, or win for the, the person, win for the bacterium that is infecting them. One of the things I thought that was really kind of cool about this paper is that they sort of bring this home to a population viewpoint of infection, right? So mice that develop anorexia get very sick and sometimes die, but the trade-off is they don't transmit Transmit it very well to other mice, so this is in general better for the population of mice as a whole, and obviously bad for the individual, individual and bad for the bacteria, uh, which probably explains why these bacteria then developed ways to manipulate this access. Does anyone have any thoughts this, on that? It's just like it's the Ebola thing, right? Yeah. Like Ebola is, a, is right. a crappy pathogen, even though it kills everything, right. every yeah. human it that kills it infects. Too fast. But it's a really bad pathogen because yep. it just burns itself out. Exactly. Um, I, I will note that in that last figure in F, I just noticed it now, but the survival of the wild type primary are way yeah. lower in this I than in too. anywhere else in the paper. So it suggests to me that they like they jacked up the infection a little bit. But keep to, in mind too, they to make sure they get dissemination. But that's looking a lot further out in infection than they look previously. Uh, so typically in these survival graphs, they they're looking 15. like three days post-infection or, well, oh, in some of these really cases, they went out pretty far. Okay, so I'm seeing but well, still, yeah, but still, like 12 days. days. No, you're right. You're totally right. But, okay. No, but I do see your, it I, is, I more, it is definitely criticism. more dramatic. You are right about that, at least at the end point. <laughs> 
Yeah. So I think throughout the rest of it, you see around 50% survival at 12 days. Yeah. That Is looks that about right. Similar here. Yeah. So actually that, yeah, yeah it does it's sort lower. of sync up. It's a little faster, but maybe a couple days faster. Yeah. Are But are the wild type primary, the slurp P primary, those are, that's like, those are time of, sorry. Those were directly infected as opposed yeah, to so being co the first yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. The secondary just refers to the uninfected mice. Yeah. Gotcha, this should look gotcha. like the okay. first phase. Yeah. 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 That's a good point. But yeah, this is super cool. Yeah. yeah. I thought this was a neat paper. I really enjoyed I it. I totally buy it. The discussion was very philosophical. I feel like in ways that a lot of papers I read lately are just not, you know, mm-hmm. they went very far beyond their, what they proved in this paper to really get did, into it. Did a, she actually, was she actually a postdoc with Ruslan Metzitov or is it just that he has said nice things about I her? I think it's just that he has said nice things about her. I could, I could again be wrong about that as well, but I didn't come across that, at least not in the stat article. I was going to say that because that feels like something that uh, I know John does that. So I was wondering yeah, if that's she also like came a... out of David Schneider's lab, okay. who does that right. as well and also works on the tolerance question. Um, Got it. I mean, like these are all people who, like myself, like to make graphs that have no numbers on them. But, you know, just like <laughs> have like Y and X axes labeled with theoretical concepts and then do lines <laughs> and shading. <laughs> To make your point, there's a lot of information that you can put in a theoretical graph of theoretical (laughs) outcomes. That seems right. Yeah. And those graphs are made in PowerPoint. They are made in PowerPoint. And you can look at them in my (laughs) molecular cell review. Can I say my 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 thesis? (laughs) <laughs> my my favorite part of this uh, paper was in the introduction where it was talking about the sickness behaviors mm-hmm. and it was talking about sleep disturbances, social withdrawal and changes in grooming. And I was just yeah. thinking about like, what's the human equivalent to changes in grooming? Um, just that like, you just like don't <laughs> want to shower when you're sick and or how that would be helpful or not. Stay in your pajamas. Yeah. So, I mean, that would certainly help prevent my family from having any interest in being around me, or at least oh, my husband. My kids wouldn't touché, care. Touché. <laughs> stay away. <laughs> my I husband smell. be like, "You stink. <laughs> Go away." <laughs> and then, yeah, I wonder how much because this is a mutant version of Salmonella that causes more anorexia, and I'm wondering when people get. I mean, when when you get Salmonella, you do get these type of responses, no? Right? You do feel nauseous. You lose a little bit of weight. I wonder if there are any mutant versions around in the wild that people get that would mimic. Well, presumably they would be uh, less less be- er, efficient at transmission uh, transmitting. Right, right. So maybe no. I have no idea. But again, this could be context dependent and infection dependent. So this may not be true of other infections, or you know, it may be that if they were to do this study in human beings, they'd see the opposite. Who knows? Very I buy it. I'm yeah. glad they can't do this <laughs> well, in humans. If you <laughs> if you gross. like. Very theoretical, deep discussions at the end of papers. You should read a lot of ecology papers. I think that's where a lot of this <laughs> was started. <laughs> nice. you all, yeah, you go back to the 60s, just all discussion sections, like a tiny little bit of data, giant discussion on like the theoretical implications. It's great. I love it. <laughs> I beautiful. like that kind of yeah. thing. <laughs> I think this is where we're going to stop. So thanks, Shadine, for taking us through that paper in wonderful detail. Um, this has been Audio Immunity. If you want to interact with us outside the podcast, we have a Facebook page. Do we have a Twitter, Kevin? Did we ever do that? We have a Facebook page. We have a Patreon. And if you are... Tell them what it is, Kate. Tell them what the Facebook and Patreon pages are. The Facebook page, <laughs> Audio Immunity on Facebook. Facebook.com slash audio immunity. Facebook.com slash audio immunity. If you type that into your browser, you have to delete this podcast. You go into Facebook (laughs) and you write audio immunity in the search bar like a normal human. (laughs) You do not write full full web addresses. I would not have any of any of our listeners doing that nonsense. Audio immunity, just so everyone knows, is spelled audio. That was, A-U-D-I-O. That's actually, okay, that makes sense. M-M-U-N-I-T-Y. Yeah. Apparently, we shouldn't have done the double M, and Kate only decided to bring this to my attention <laughs> four, four years, years after we started this goddamn podcast, <laughs> and I'm not bitter at all. And to be honest, not I, at thought, all. I thought the I was there the whole time, because it just it just seems like it's there. Yeah. But okay. Oh boy, this is just going to get more confusing. Name. We we, uh, we all agreed to this, Kate. Uh, all of us. To be fair, I Every did not. Every single one of I them. I did not like the name. <laughs> but I went uh, with it. 
for the pun truth reasons. Will out. <laughs> the puns okay. be strong with these ones. <laughs> What's our website, Kate? Our website is emunity.org. E M M U N I T Y dot O R G. And well done. The, <laughs> well done. Is the intro and outro music still composed and performed by Rachel Reinick? Sure is. Awesome. That would also, that can be added to the end. <laughs> um, <laughs> and now I'm trying to remember is there any other business to wrap up at the end uh, I don't think so just go go give us money on Patreon please oh yeah and if you want to be we'll a Patreon subscriber we're trying to figure out um, what sorts of perks you're going to get if you have an idea if you have a request you can let, if you have a you paper you want us, us to review yeah leave us an well, you can email us about the Patreon thing. Um, but on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, where all your podcasts are found, leave us reviews, tell your friends. We love our audience. We love hearing from our listeners. And have a great rest of your day. And, you know, enjoy that radio lab up, Kate, that you're up. about to listen to. <laughs> <laughs> that just spiraled. <laughs> no, I'm just trying to think of what the radio lab it, podcast is. It tends to do that with Kate. <laughs> <laughs> You know, take care and also enjoy Radio Lab because I bet that's what you're listening to next. Oh, Radio Lab! They listen to Radio Lab before us, Kate. Come on, <laughs> be realistic. Well, you know, I think maybe don't we publish the day before them? Uh, who knows? Okay. Depends anyway. on when I get the thing out of anyway. <laughs> We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. <laughs>